presentation. And can you also see my, my mouse? Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much, Annika and Pelou, for inviting me and uh, to this very exciting workshop. So I enjoyed it very much. And um, uh, thank you, Annika, for the nice introduction. So I'll be talking today about the imaging subdivision in Substantia Nigra. And we'll try to ask the question if the in vivo mapping of dopaminergic neurons is possible with MRI. And I think when I revised my introductory slides today in the morning, I realized that I probably shouldn't tell much after the exciting talks yesterday. So I don't need the motivation why we actually would like have to bridge from histology to MRI after Leah's and Annika's talk. But I'll uh, start with that. So I'll talk about the main motivation to combine MRI and histology. And I'll show how we are doing it in Leipzig, because there are some special aspects. And then for the rest of my talk, I'll be talking about the one particular application, imaging of substantia nigra, and show you three, um, uh, three studies which we have done there. So coming from post-mortem histology in the direction of in vivo MRI. So if you think about exploring terra incognita, um, and starting the journey, they are very important to have the possibility to, to, to answer key questions. Where are we? Uh, what do we see there with MRI? And why does the structures like, like this in health and pathology? And actually histology can help us to do that. I think we have seen a lot of very nice um, uh, uh, answering this question from Eugenio, Leah and Jonathan yesterday. So in terms of how, you also have seen a very nice um, work on how to combine three-dimensional MRI with two-dimensional histology and what we can do about it. And I would like to talk about the one particular aspect which uh, we feel is important because we think uh, also histology is great. MRI has two advantages. First of all, it is three-dimensional and it is at least it's quantitative. So actually MRI provide and, and it's of course non-invasive, <laughs> that's very, very important. So with the, so what we are doing with MRI in Leipzig that we are trying to move from the weighted images to the multimodal mapping, quantitative mapping of the brain and try to extract all possible quantitative parameters and this using the physical model. And then we hope to be able to use the biophysical model of tissue and MRI contrast to be able to link these quantitative parameters to the underlying microstructural, microscopical uh, tissue components such as cells, vessels, or fibers. And um, there the histology is uh, played a very important role. So as you might know, and it has been mentioned yesterday many times, there are actually only a few tissue components which we are sensitive to. And the mains are myelin, which is very important in white matter, but also in the subcortex, iron and neuronal fibers. And as uh, we also heard a lot uh, from Dagmar, for example, in particular in subcortex, iron is a very important contrast source and it's um, influenced uh, such parameters as a T1 relaxation, turn R2 star, QSM and R2. And that's uh, what I will explore in my talk in order to extract more information about the iron rich structures. And to do so, we actually need a physical model of the iron induced contrast. So there will be a lot, I'll be talking a lot about that, about this modeling. And if you think about the iron, I think um, in the cortex, it's, it's or um, in, in the past, it's sometimes have been used as the one component, but actually there is more than simply iron. And um, in subcortex, it's even more complex than in the uh, cortex and the white matter, because the iron can come in the, in the brain in a different chemical forms. We are all familiar with hemoglobin, which can even change its magnetic property and, and impact on MRI uh, contrast, but two other iron storage molecules, such as ferritin, which is mostly important for glial cells and for the white and gray matter, and neuromelanin, which is particularly present in the cells of locus truus and substantia nigra, has a very different magnetic properties. And for neuromelanin, for example, we even don't know it. And this different chemical form differently impact different MR parameters. So that's a mass on the one side, but from the other hand, we can hope to combine the parameters and get more specific information perhaps about these different iron pools. And also that's uh, a very happy Dagma, I mentioned it yesterday, that also the cellular distribution of iron is very complex. And uh, this weekend, this a very nice paper from the Markus Borowski group was accepted, um, where he 
quantitatively map different cellular population using the proton-induced X-ray emission. So that's a quantitative um, accelerator-based uh, uh, metric and have shown that also in the most of the brain, glial cells has the highest iron concentration. It's very different in the subcortex. For example, dopaminergic neurons are iron champions. Yeah. So again, we know, for, as a physicist, we know that the cellular iron distribution would impact MRI parameters, and there might be a window of opportunity to get some specific information about this different cellular populations. So that is, with this ideas, we started the journey and, um, and asked ourselves, is the mapping of cellular iron distribution and iron chemical form is possible. And the, um, most of the work I'll be, uh, show was the PhD, is a PhD project of Malte Bramlow, who is fortunately in the audience, so he can correct me if I'm telling something wrong. And so he is this one and this exploring terrain cognitive now and asking all the questions. So just to uh, say a few words about substantial nigra, it's the uh, one of the basant ganglia, and uh, importantly, it contains dopaminergic neurons who are, the, who are the source of cortical dopamine. And uh, the loss of these uh, cells and the loss of the dopamine is the primary cause of PD disease, which Bernadette and, and, and many others were mentioning yesterday and talking so nicely about that. And interestingly, the dopaminergic neurons are known to be very iron rich, as, as I mentioned before from showing the Murawski group work. And interestingly, so the, the anatomy and the function of substantial rank is, is quite complex. And it not only has the dopaminergic neurons, but actually the majority of the neurons there are GABA nurturing. And um, as, as can be shown with these two different um, cytological states, the calpending positive GABAergic neurons and tyrosine hydroxylate positive dopaminergic neurons are kind of um, organized in a mutually um, um, exclusive way. So there are pockets with the calpindin uh, poor pockets where we have a lot of clouds of dopaminergic neurons. And um, the classical work of Damier et al. has been um, described, describing at least five of such nigrosome, how they call it. And this is a clouds which predominantly contain the dopaminergic neurons. And the biggest and largest of them is the N1. And this and one is particularly important for Parkinson's disease because it has been shown also by the classical work of Damier that the neuro, uh, neurons in and one die first in Parkinson. So you, you see it here, the uh, stains of the Chelsea control and the um, Parkinson patient. And the, this cloud of N1 is really gone. And interestingly, and that's really intriguing, it's several years ago that it has been shown that MRI also shows some structures in substantia nigra which disappear in Parkinson. And first it was called um, hyperintensity. And in the T2 star weighted image, we see the so-called swallow tail. So it's a light structure surrounded by the dark structure, just like a swallow tail here. And the swallow tail disappear in Parkinson patient and the clinic or the patient with symptoms can be classified with the incredible sensitivity and specificity of something like 90%. So in, it's interesting because a T2 star is an iron sensitive marker. We know that the neurons are iron rich. And we also know from the histological study that there are changes in iron content in, in Parkinson. So it seems to be very interesting and very promising. So it seems to be that we see a very interesting specific neuronal marker here. And there has been a very influential study from Nottingham Group who overlaid the postmortem MRI and histology and suggested that actually this hyperintensity or the, the swallow tail, this uh, light part, correspond to nigrosome 1. And based on this study, it, uh, it spread this interpretation to the clinical literature. And if you look into the, now the, for nigrosome 1, you mostly get not a histological work, but MRI work and um, uh, more and more studies, which I just call it nigrosome 1 imaging. So the swallowtail is now regarded to be a nigrosome 1. So it looks, seems to be very interesting and very promising. And uh, also in combination with the uh, pathological work showing that especially there, there are some different interesting pattern of cellular, cellular concentration increase in Parkinson. We thought it might be very interesting to look into this uh, with um, quantitative MRI 
and modeling and try to understand what's going on there. So we start our journey. And um, the first question we ask is, what could we actually see with MRI? And we started to bridge between the MRI and microscopy by doing MRI microscopy. So in the next slide, you see the images of the substantia nigra recorded at the um, um, 9.4 Tesla in cooperation with the Jürgen Reichenbach room with a resolution of 22 microns. And this is the gradient echo titus weighted image where you really see in the substantia nigra dark dots uh, in the magnitude image and a kind of dipole in the face image. And if you compare this with the histology, this is just an unstained slide where we highlighted neuromelanin rich neurons, there is a very striking correspondence. So these dots are really neurons. And I think it's really exciting because that's probably the only neurons you can directly see with MRI. And uh, we did the uh, next step. So since these neurons were uh, looking into the face images, they really looked like a dipole. So it's, it's a dream of every physicist having the magnetic sphere um, surrounded by non-magnetic tissue. And uh, we asked us a question, could we actually do a QSM on a single cell then? Um, and uh, this is what we have done. We spotted a couple of cells which we can, which, which, which were like single cells with nothing around. So we can uh, nicely identify them in the magnitude and normal frequency maps. And then we quantified the iron content using PIXI in the subsecutive histology. And here you see the uh, magnetic moment of the cells plotted against this iron content. And fitting this with the linear, with the linear um, uh, uh, dependence, we can actually obtain susceptibility of neuromelanin, which is actually the quite unknown value because it's very difficult to, uh, to measure it with, with other technique. So now we can use this information to try to bridge between the histology and MRI and try to predict MRI directly from histology. And this is what Malte did here. He used the, uh, the neuronal mask uh, from histology and converted this with the susceptibility of melanin and some reluxometry model to predict the R2 star contribution at three and seven Tesla from those neurons. And um, here you see the measured R2 star, which also contained the contribution of other tissue components, such as melanin, um, um, myelin, and, um, and other uh, iron pools. And what you see that we can really nicely reproduce at least this pattern mm, here, and also uh, nicely predict the, the scaling of relaxation rate between the field. So that's exciting because we can quantitatively link the, between the QSM and uh, or uh, MRI and histology. So it seems to be that if we would have this resolution, we would be able to map these neurons in, in vivo. And then um, uh, we actually had an idea that since we see these neurons directly in the MRI, could we actually try to create the alternative neurosome definition just to look into those tiny dots and um, segmenting nigrosome and segmenting those clouds. And in the three samples, we compared those delineation of neuronal clouds in MRI or in neuromelanin unstained section where the neuromelanin is visible with the classical definition by calpindine and tyrosine hydroxylase staining. And you see that the correspondence was very, very well. So it's about 84% um, overlay uh, across these three sections, what we have shown. So the microsome are in principle visible uh, using MRI microscopy. Okay, then we, we asked um, the next question. Um, of course, we would never be able to achieve such resolution in vivo. Um, can we still extract some quantitative markers of dopaminergic neurons even using MRI with lower resolution? And so why does the microsome look like they look like? And can we link the um, extract some cellular information there? And what we have done, we first performed quantitative mapping of R2 star in the, um, uh, at seven Tesla this time at three samples. And you see here that a slice of a substantial necker, which uh, actually go through the nigrosome three, shown here, and nigrosome one. And again, we could identify the nigrosome using the um, high resolution artistic weighted image. It's not as high as uh, 9.4 Tesla, but it's still 50 micrometers. So you don't see a single point, but it's kind of granular structures here. And also comparing this with histology, we see that the nigrosome appear 
hyper intense. So they have a very short atrista due to the presence of the neuromelanin containing neurons, which are iron rich, as we see here with pixie and unstained section. So it seems to be that the iron and dopaminergic neurons is the main source of R2 star in the nigrosome. Now we can precisely quantify this effect of iron by chemically removing iron from the tissue. So we just expose it to some iron gelators and then the measure R2, uh, uh, all our quantitative MRI before and after extraction. And you see that after we remove the iron, actually all the granular structure, so neurons become invisible uh, after iron is removed. And also we don't see this nice structures in R2 star anymore. So actually comparing quantitative with these maps, we can now precisely quantify the amount of relaxation, which is directly due to iron here. And this is a quite a large number. So it's about 60 inverse um, seconds, which is a very, very uh, large and very nicely measurable value. And now we ask the question, okay, now we would like to understand, is this entire, how much, so how well do we understand this contrast theoretically and how can we link it with the neurons or is it probably due to iron and other um, cellular structures? And for that, we first created the full physical model of our voxel. So we performed 3D histology of the one um, of, of contiguous slices and calibrated this iron stains with pixie. So we get the full a quantitative map of iron distribution within our voxel. Then we simulated what would be the local magnetic field perturbation about around the cells. And then Malte performed the huge uh, theoretical work trying to find the proper relaxation mechanism this, uh, um, uh, here and comparing this with the Monte Carlo simulation of water running around the molecules, uh, around the iron rich cells. And actually we found that there is a very simple and very beautiful description, which is called static dephasing. And in this um, description, actually, the entire R2 prime is simply proportional to the total iron in the dopaminergic neuron. So it's proportional to the total number of neuron in the voxel multiplied by the average iron content. And that's very nice. Um, you see that uh, when we overlaid the uh, theoretical prediction on which, which you see here on our measured relaxation rate, we are in the very well agreement. And actually, we proposed that if we would be able to segment the nigrosome and then subtract and to measure the contrast between the nigrosome and directly surrounding tissue, then this marker um, to 60% is actually reflecting that quantitatively the total iron in dopaminergic neurons and might be a very interesting marker to measure in Parkinson's disease. For example, I mean, if we dream about it to have those resolution and this sensitivity in vivo, it should be able to detect the early uh, cell loss uh, or early iron accumulation in the cells. So it sounds very interesting and very promising. Well, but it just contradicts the current view and current interpretation of the swallow tail feature, which I described to you before. Because actually in the entire uh, clinical literature, microsomes are described as this really big structures, which has a low R2 star, while we think that's a very thin uh, structure within it with a high R2 star. So and since we uh, repeated this experiment many times in different tissue samples, and then we have seen that the same is observed in the heads we investigated with Zanike. We thought, okay, perhaps we should ask our important questions, which we should have asked very in the very beginning. Where are we actually in the in the substantial nigra? And um, we thought that first we should we should prove actually that the structures we see here, these very fine ones, are the nigrosome and challenge the current interpretation. But to do so, we need um, to do it in, in, an, in an other level as it has been done before. So for this purpose, we used this unique data set Annika actually acquired um, and, and used all the advantage of this data set, having the very high resolution MRI with the protocol comparing to what we uh, have in vivo with the fully 3D histology. And here we were very lucky because um, Negrosomes are very appear very dark in block face images. So actually, this uh, beautiful images and this beautiful video is very happy about uh, Anik was showing the video. 
allow delineation of the nigrosome directly, even without any staining. And that is what we have done. So we first um, looked into the, and here, that, that, that's I think the beauty of the data set. That's a Z2 star weighted image at seven Tesla. And we have exactly the similar data, the very, very, very similar data from our in vivo participants. And that's just the block face imaging. And uh, Pilou did some magic to co-register them and, and might even uh, further improve this co-registration by the landmarks to, to improve this in, in the substantial. Um, and the approach which we followed there was uh, following. So we decided to, you know, to, to, to make it fully independent and to, so we asked the question, is the swallow tail actually identical to microsome one? And we asked the um, Nottingham group to join us for, for this. And we are very, very happy to get Penny Goldland, who is uh, very experienced in, in looking into the uh, swallowtail feature, because we were afraid to be biased by our hypothesis. And what we have done, we first um, took the in vivo images of, uh, acquired with exactly the same protocol. And Penny was very you know, kind to segment swallowtail in there. We then took the uh, block face imagings uh, prepared by Anneke and Pilou, and then uh, used the Marcos um, competence to segment the nigrosome in there, and then multi, 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 made a final magic and put them all together. Uh, also, he done it before he knew where the um, solo term, where the nigrosomes are. And here I'll show you the, so and then we add, additionally use the histology. So basically we backed up this uh, registration of microsome based on the neuromelanin only with the calbidin stains to be really, to have a very clean histological um, uh, procedure there. And uh, here are the results. So you see the three different postmortem heads also combined with the three different in vivo data sets. And this is in red, you see the microsome segmentation based on the microsome one segmentation based on the neuromelanin and then yellow, the swallow tail segmentation. And although they partly uh, overlap in all of them, but they are uh, definitely not core line. So actually they look like something like this. So if you think about the um, nigrosome and then um, the uh, swallow tail and the nigrosome. And I think that's very interesting because if, if you think about this um, uh, metaphor, um, it's not necessarily that the one can disappear and the other stay. So they are not identical. So they're not coil line and they might be not, not identical. And I think, uh, so then um, if we look into the histology of uh, substantial nigrine Parkinson and in the um, uh, uh, control brain, you also can see it actually in the histology. So for example, uh, that's, that's also the slides provided by um, uh, Marcos, here you see the swallow tail, the hyper intensity correspond to this area in the pearl stain, which show low ferritin iron, while the nigrosome is actually running somewhere in between here. And also this part is gone, and, and also the cells are gone in uh, Parkinson. We do not know if these two structures are actually causally related to each other, or this is a, probably two different physiological process, uh, uh, pr uh, processes, right? And um, I'm just checking if I have two more minutes. Anike, would I have two more minutes or shall I yeah, wrap up? Okay, so, so that's basically the, um, perhaps I'll first conclude with our nigrosome work. Um, we've shown that the uh, nigrosomes show increased R2 star driven by iron and dopaminergic neumor, uh, neurons. And it's very well predicted quantitatively by static dephasing theory, and that the total iron content of the pneumonic neurons can be extracted from R2 star and R2 combination. And we think that could be an important step towards specific early stage PD biomarker based on the DN depletion before the onset of motor symptoms. And we just submitted the grant application together with um, Annika and Pillow to test this actually in vivo. And um, what we also seen that the in vivo protocols require submillimeter resolution. So it's a resolution is very important to identify these small structures. And also that the swallow tail and N1 are not synonyms. And then uh, 3D nigrosome atlas um, is required for in vivo MRI and search for PD biomarkers. And perhaps before I um, uh, go to the question, I'll show you some one outlook which I decided uh, after we have seen this exciting chimpanzee data 
um, yesterday, because um, in parallel to this work on humans, um, we have a very unique data set we also, where we also can do some comparative neuroanatomy. And this is a collaboration with the um, Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, who has um, the big observation sites in Africa and also do some observation in European zoo, where they follow and uh, chimpanzees and describe their behavior. And uh, recently they got a permission to keep the post-mortem brain of the animals if they died of natural causes. And Ilona Lip is a postdoc in our department. She's running the similar protocols as we do in vivo in a post-mortem brain on those brain. And we are stuck, we are started actually to look into the uh, R2 Stein and their subcortex recently. And I think the very interesting thing about this data set that it covers, it's a post-mortem data set, which, which is our closest relatives, and which also cover a uh, developmental uh, stage. And there we see very interesting thing actually in the substantia nigra, which also um, support this hypothesis that the swallowtail and nigrosome uh, are, are different things. So we first <clears throat> see accumulation in neuromelanin in those cells till they're at the age of um, 30 or uh, earlier. And then we see as the surrounding tissue become more bright in R2 star. So there seems to be that these two processes are also decoupled in terms of the development. I'm, I'm looking forward, we just started with the histology of this brain. I think there will be more coming out soon. Right, and with that, I would like to uh, wrap up and thank a lot of people who contributed to this work, particularly Malti, whom I mentioned a lot, but also Carson, who performed a lot of histology, and Tilo Reinert, um, who do a lot of uh, PIXI analysis and quantitative cellular iron mapping, and uh, also Karen Pine, who is our leading um, postdoc on the MPM implementation, and the entire neurophysics department, as well as the many co-authors, particularly Markus Murawski, with whom we are working very, very um, closely into the cellular iron distribution, and of course, this really cool group from Amsterdam uh, with whom we did a lot of crazy experiments and uh, there might be a lot of uh, stories we can tell during the Gather Town beer about this crazy head project. And thank you very much for your attention. Well done, uh, FK.